So welcome back. We're going to continue our programs today with a great discussion on growing healthier communities and more sustainable food play in sports. My name's Joe Abernathy. I'm the Vice President of Stadium Operations for the St. Louis Cardinals and proud to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Green Sports Alliance. You know, we heard discussions today and a lot of times when we talk about sustainability, we, we talk about journeys. And my journey in uh, sustainability started um, many years ago in a forum just like this where Alan, who's not here right now, uh, Alan challenged Major League Baseball operators to try and run a sustainable building. And with that, back in 2007, I believe that was, uh, Scott Jenkins and I volunteered to be co-chairman of a sustainability operations committee for Major League Baseball. And not long after that, Scott and many of the teams up in the Northwest formed this uh, great alliance and brings us to uh, fast forward to a day like today when you know we can gather and talk about great stuff like energy utilization and solid waste management and water conservation, great issues that unfortunately prior to Allen's challenge to Major League Baseball just some seven years ago, that wasn't a major topic. We couldn't get talk about that when we would get together. We'd talk about you know, we talk about uh, security and other issues relative to sport. But now that we've been able to bring that to a focus on on operational issues and, more importantly, sustainable operation issues, uh, it's really made a difference in sport. Uh, we've got a great representation of many uh, teams from Major League Baseball as well as the other sport leagues. And, and we have, appreciate you guys coming to join us to uh, continue this discussion and continue the journey. Today, our journey, will, as we said earlier, will take a focus more on food. Um, our moderator today, uh, Alice uh, Henley, she's the director of the Green uh, Programs at the Green Sports Alliance. She's a real champion in sport and environmental areas uh, as well. She's a NCAA uh, rowing champion from her days at Yale. And she's also a champion in the environmental community, as earlier this year, she won the highest recognition that can be presented uh, to the public by the EPA. Uh, she was named an environmental champion uh, for much of her work that she did in developing many of the uh, game changer reports that the Green Sports Alliance and the NRDC uh, had put together. Alice had spent quite a few years with the NRDC, working with us at the Green Sports Alliance, uh, putting together uh, many of the papers and campaigns, publications uh, on um, the greening of sport. Uh, in particular, her she's been a lead author in the Game Changing Report series. These are some seminal publications that document North America's professional and collegiate sports greening leaders. So Alice has got a great panel assembled for us here today and will be telling us more about how we can, uh, how food can play a part in our sustainable efforts. So Alice, it's all yours. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. It's great to be here with you all. Oh, what an honor. So. We've heard about this growing dialogue across the sports industry about food. Where is it coming from? How is it being made? How is water scarcity, climate change, and other environmental issues impacting supply and cost? How is it making us healthier, stronger? As we heard during the athletes panel yesterday evening, and as we know, food is closely linked to athlete performance. As we celebrate athletes for their physical awesomeness, they in turn inspire millions of fans to lead healthier, more active lifestyles. Similarly, iconic sports teams can help build healthier food systems in the communities where they play. And they can do that while enhancing the game day experience. That is a trend that is taking off right now. 
Ballparks, arenas, stadiums, racetracks, they're increasing the availability of healthier, more diverse menu options. They're serving local, organic produce, donating unsold meals, minimizing and composting food waste. More and more venues are even growing food on site. They're switching to 100% compostable and recyclable services. They're serving only sustainably sourced seafood. And they're choosing antibiotic-free meats. So to open our next panel, I have the exciting opportunity to announce something that has been two years in the making. I am proud to release the Green Sports Alliance's new report, Champions of Game Day Food, featuring more sustainable food initiatives from 20 professional sports venues across North America. This report shows... Ooh. Sheila! <laughs> Love you too. This report shows how sports venues, which collectively serve hundreds of millions of fans each year, are partnering with major concessionaires to enhance food practices while educating fans and the marketplace about healthier food and stronger food systems. Your summit bag includes copies of this report. We want to hear from you. Hashtag green sports. Hashtag healthier food. Tell us what you think. Give us your feedback. Join the conversation. The Green Sports Alliance is proud to produce this report with the Natural Resources Defense Council. The Champions of Game Day Food case studies span menu design and procurement, energy, water, and waste efficiency in kitchens, food packaging and service, as well as food donation and diversion. This report confirms the growing trend towards more efficient and environmentally intelligent practices throughout the life cycle of game day food. The venues features, featured in this report provide successful models that all food providers should emulate. This morning, we have the opportunity to discuss some of these accomplishments, the challenges that we're facing in this space, and how this work can contribute to a more sustainable food system globally. So let's dive into it. Let's get going. I'd like to invite the panelists to the stage, starting with Chef Jennifer Cox, Regional Vice President of Culinary for Levy Restaurants. Jennifer. <clears throat> Carl Middleman, President of Aramark Sports and Entertainment Division. Welcome, Carl. And Will Witherspoon, 12-year NFL veteran and owner of the 500-acre Shiregate Farm. I'd like to please submit questions. The staff are passing out cards during this session. Please submit questions. We'll include those at the end, and we'll start off now. Am I mic'd up? Okay, brilliant. Okay. Welcome all. Thank, thank you for you, being here. Yeah. So to begin, let's give a little bit of background on yourselves, your work, and can you tell us about how does more sustainable, greener food get defined by your institutions? What does that mean to you? Starting with me? Please. <laughs> thank you, Jennifer. Um, my name is Jennifer Cox, and uh, I work for Levy Restaurants. Um, Levy uh, started out as a, a little restaurant company that could and ventured into the sports and entertainment world a little over 35 years ago. Um, I myself have been a chef for 20 some years and um, did not start out cooking. Started out as a um, sales rep for Procter & Gamble. And uh, so I sold shampoo and deodorant for a living. And so you can imagine uh, going into the food world is a lot more interesting, uh, even as a dishwasher and a line cook. And I've been cooking for about 25 years. Um, I've cooked in probably every type of venue you can imagine. So I've, I've really seen it all from small little 
um, a la carte restaurants to larger a la carte restaurants. Um, I've been in hotels. I've worked. Probably the only place I really haven't cooked is prison uh, and hospital. And I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, so, so I like to say that I right now have probably one of the best jobs um, as a chef because we have the opportunity, and I know Carl will tag onto this, I mean, we get to like work in really exciting environments offering food and beverage to people in moments when they want to be entertained. So we have this tremendous capacity to bring joy to people, which is a really great thing for a chef. Um, we try to do that in a way that is as responsible um, to the environment and to the world as we can. It is not always easy. It is a tremendous challenge um, because we serve so many people and make so much food. To do it responsibly sometimes means you end up buying all of any one thing just to make that happen. And so it's a really tough equation to master um, in our world because of the, num the sheer numbers and volume. Um, but we are, I would say, constantly, daily, looking for new ways to do it responsibly. And quite frankly, part of it is because it's, it's from a revenue standpoint, it's mm -hmm. better for us to do that as well. Makes our numbers better. Great. Thank you. Carl. Great. Well, good morning, everybody, and, uh, and thanks for having us here. Uh, Aramark is, is proud to have been part of the Green Sports Alliance uh, since its uh, inception and just honored to be here with you today. Um, I, I don't have an MVP or a college championship to talk about. Um, I've been selling hot dogs and beer for a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, grew up with Aramark and have spent my entire career with the company um, in a variety of different roles and primarily within our sports and entertainment business. I did spend a few years in our parks and destinations businesses, at, which is where I actually learned a lot about sustainability and the greening efforts uh, that are out there today. As, as, as we think about what, um, what does sustainability mean in our business, I think Jennifer hit on, on a few of the very important things that we're wrestling with uh, each and every day. Uh, you mentioned hundreds of millions of consumers that we're, that we're uh, serving uh, on a year-round basis in our venues uh, in extremely complex environments um, with uh, ever-changing demands uh, from our fans uh, and from our, our venue partners. Um, so at, at Aramark, it's really been about how do we listen to the consumer um, how do we ensure that we're meeting their needs uh, and expectations, which, which candidly are changing extremely rapidly in this space? And I think some of the statistics that were shared last night demonstrate um, how rapidly this movement is progressing um, and how incumbent it, incumbent it has become upon us as, as food and beverage and facility managers um, to really change the way we're, we're, we're setting the table, so to speak, for that consumer. Mm -hmm. um, we look at it in, in three buckets, and I like to talk about um, what's happening in food from a socialization perspective, uh, from a localization perspective, and a customization perspective. And really, the green thread threads across that entire platform um, as we, we adapt to those changing uh, consumer needs. So that's what we're focused on. Thank you, Carl. Sure. Well, I seem like I feel like I have a lot less to say now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, being here for the second year in a row, thank you again to the Green Sports Alliance for inviting me up here again. Um, I started Shiregate about nine years ago now, but uh, that was also kind of alongside my other career as a professional athlete. So my focus has always been, you know, what I ingested in my body is what I put, put out on the field because I've never been a guy who's done, you know, all these supplements that are available and everything else to try and figure out what works for me or anything there. I always looked at it and said, you know what, the best way to do this is just to eat appropriately. Um, I started Shiregate, you know, just partially for that reason. It had to put the best food on the table and on the plate for me. And um, I, I think that's always been a great concept that I've carried throughout. Once I really started understanding how I wanted to produce and what I wanted to produce in the cattle uh, industry, it's, it's, it became, what is the best thing I can do hoof the plate? And that's the way I've always tried to take that concept and look at that concept. You know, education, ed educating myself through the course. I mean, as we all kind of get to understand, I get to answer this question, it all began with two horses, so everybody's like, how did you get in the cattle? And I, uh, I always have to laugh and say, you know what, when you start looking at it and understanding what's going on and, and really delving into it, what you produce at the end of the day, and knowing that you're doing it sustainably, for the, not only for the environment, but also in a healthier manner for yourself, you know, for the people that you're going to serve. And uh, last year I had the luxury of being asked by the Rams to serve the stadium, uh, you know, doing hot dogs and burgers for the stadium, which is 
a huge you know step and leap forward um, just for the Rams themselves and, and to understand that. And for me, it was kind of one of those, they asked me that question like a week from today and they were like, hey, can you give us 12,000 hot dogs? And, you know, 25,000 burgers? Yes. I'll, I'll figure it out, but yes. And, it, you know, it was, it was a great thing. And, and now, you know, I've looked at it and now that my professional career is over uh, in one aspect, I'm working on my second professional career, you know, in, in this sustainable agriculture and, you know, working alongside these wonderful individuals to, to again, give, give the consumer the experience that they want, you know, knowing that every day we have a greater and greater need from the educated consumer wanting to understand where food comes from, localizing it, and also gathering a, a great product at the end. Thank you all. I think a trend you all touched on already is volume. What makes this sector different in food service is the tremendous volume and the number of fans that you need to serve at one event, day after day after day. And it's interesting to unpack the sustainable food system, as we, we talk about within a sports venue, the game day sustainable food system involves much more than just procurement or just the, the waste end. It's interesting to think about how you can design your system from the beginning and track the fan demand, track the interest in the variety of, of menu options, but also plan for more efficient food production throughout the system. Can you talk a little bit more about how you, you really follow fan demand and fan interest in, in menu options and how that guides the, the rest of your food supply? Potential. Sure. Um, you know, I think it's several ways. I think um, most businesses that, that do food service um, like we do are getting far more into analyzing their business differently and building teams around just analyzing their, their business as we are. Um, and as we analyze our business, we're realizing that, you know, it's kind of interesting. People say, oh, well, we, we have to have a vegetarian stand, a whole concession stand devoted to vegetarian food because people are asking for it. And the, and the truth is, People are asking for it, but in a far smaller amount. So you have to decide from a business perspective what makes the most sense. Are we really going to, um, because you don't want to waste the food either. You don't want to start producing food that ultimately will not get consumed because that's not really solving anything except maybe answering the question for a smaller margin of, of fan, right? Smaller number of fans. So trying to find the balance, taking the business annually and saying, Okay, what did we do last year? Where did people spend their money? Because that is what is going to give you answers to that bigger question. And then saying, how do we take those stands? And how do we, and I'm saying concessions mostly, but of course there's suites and chef's tables and clubs and everything that's in a building. How do we take all of that and say, where are people spending their dollar? Because where they spend their dollar is going to tell us where we should probably move forward. But then also what we're finding is taking that and, and not offering, you know, there's a, there was a school of thought a few years ago that said, let's give them everything they want. If you give them everything they want, something will stick, right? Not really. If you narrow it down, not only are you narrowing the choices and answering that question far, sim far more simply, so you're actually getting fans through the lines more quickly, which is also what they want, but you're not purchasing as much which means you're not making as much, which means you're not spending as much, and you're not throwing as much away. So if you can narrow the number of ingredients, which we are really, really doing a lot of, making the choices simpler and speaking to what the fans want, and you're not wasting as much, it sort of takes it from, then we're not donating as much. We don't want to donate our food. We would rather sell all of it, throw none of it away, and sadly not have to give any of it away either. That's when you've when you've hit the right number, right? Yeah, you know, I think I'll, I'll, I'll address it from a little bit different perspective. I agree, I agree with everything Jennifer said. It's, it's it's what keeps us up at night. How do you take complexity out of the business, um, which makes everyone's lives a lot easier? It, it makes the lines move faster. Should make a happier customer, and ultimately should make ourselves and our partners more money. Um, but but I think what I wanted to just touch on. Um, are the, the steps that have been taken in the food system that are very positive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and your report uh, is, is tremendous in terms of demonstrating those steps that have been taken. But, 
but we're still at a very infant stage of, of crawling. Uh, maybe maybe we're, we're learning how to walk when it comes to this, uh, this initiative. And it's really breaking down the system into the different silos. And, and when you think about the procurement side, um, and I don't know, in baseball we probably two and a, need two and a half million pounds of hot dogs to service our venues. And, well, I'd love for your cattle to step up and, and help. I'm not sure you have enough on the farm to, to demonstrate that. And, and, and we'd love to say we can sell you know, all organic French fries from organic potatoes. Um, but quite frankly, the supply chain just doesn't produce enough organic potatoes to meet the demand of, of the volume that we're serving. So we really have to break it down into um, where can we have an impact, um, but make sure it's a meaningful impact. It's not just something that we're doing so we can check a box. And I think the examples that you showed in your report really do demonstrate initiatives that have been put in place that have a measurable impact. And so whether it's gardens uh, that we're seeing in, in the different venues that have been popping up, while they're not providing a, a year-round supply of, of produce, they are augmenting certain, um, certain opportunities during the course of a, of a season or the, or the, the harvest. But, um, but it's really breaking it down where, there, where we have those opportunities, focusing on the different levers that we can pull uh, within the industry at the end of the day. Um, and I think what's remarkable is when you look at the examples that you've shown, you have markets that you wouldn't typically think are those that are going to be associated with helping to, to take complexity out of the system. Mm -hmm. St. Louis, Cleveland, Pittsburgh are not cities that come to my mind um, when I think about the green movement. Yet when you look at some of the examples, it's really coming from um, all parts of the country. And I think that's tremendous in terms of showing that these little steps uh, over time will um, will help us achieve a lot more of the goals that we're out to that we're out to gain. And I just would like to tag on to one thing that you said, if you don't mind. I think um, I think it also, you know, in locations where you do have rooftop gardens, or you know, we've got a convention center that is raising bees and chickens on the roof, which is just crazy. Um, it also sends a message, I think, to the consumer that says, "Oh, wait a minute, I can. This is interesting. If they're doing this locally." I can do more locally, too. And it's sort of a subtle message, but I think it's an important one because I think it's sort of the leading by example. Mm -hmm. So even if, you know, even, of course, you know, we can't buy all local, uh, you know, 100% local hot dogs. We have the same two and a half million pound number. So that's five million just with our, our two companies, seriously. Um, at that's just baseball. And that's, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't How many add sports? All there, right? Don't add all the rest of it together. Um, you you do have the it sends a message it sort of says wow if at the at the at the arena if they can bring in this local farm i'm going to look for this local farm at my next farmers market and take this idea one step further back to my own family i mean that's the hope that's maybe a little blue sky idealistic but that would be the hope you're taking the words right out of my mouth <laughs> okay <laughs> i love, I love not it too far from the truth actually it's you'd be amazed at how many people were sending me messages or asking me more messages about Shiregate once they once they started seeing that. And as you said, it it does carry on. Yeah, would I love to give you both two and a half million pounds of hot dogs every year? Yes. But uh, the truth is, we know that there is a, a scalable matter that we have to handle in that. That you know, finding that finite number of what meets the the consumer demand. I mean, no matter how you cut it, ninety percent of the sports venues, it's the number one eaten most eaten products are hot dogs and hamburgers. So. If you're going to look at it from that standpoint, how do you meet that demand? How do you do that? And for, for me, you know, last year, because one, as I said, it was kind of a last minute undertaking that kind of got brought to my attention. The way we worked that out was we said, okay, what we're gonna do is we'll take a portion of this and this is gonna be club level, suite level item. You know, we'll start with that. But we also took several games where we put kiosks down in the lower level so everybody got to enjoy and everybody had the option to to be involved and participate. And that did great things for me and, and for Shiregate. And, you know, it's grown to a point just just from that one event last year where I'm sitting there going, well, look, we're going to have to think of something else for this year and how we're going to work that. Okay. But for the consumers, I think it's, it, as, you, as you both have said, how can you reach them efficiently? How can you reach them effectively and provide what they want without, you know, putting yourselves out there and overextending yourselves and in, in saying, we're going to buy... X number of this and X number of that and Y number of this just to see what people like and what they'll take. Well, if you know you got two and a half million pounds of hot dogs every year, well, can you make a number where you get, you know, 100,000 pounds a year and you figure out something that works on both sides? From a producer standpoint, our biggest problem is production. 
You know, production, the average producer for a grass-fed ranch produces four to five head of cattle a year. One of those is for their own family. So that's only about 1,500 pounds of beef that you end up with. So how do you meet that demand? When you've got a million pound demand at any particular point in time. The other problem is it's hard to get people to work collectively together and understand that if you work in a stream, you can actually get to the lake. Like it's, it's much better that way. I, I, that's the, the other hurdle that I think is, it needs to be met um, in, in the sustainable movement. You know, you have many producers who want to do things and work into them in the environments as, as such, but they can't because they're only willing to work in their box. They're not willing to work across the board together. I think you bring up another good point that if we may not be able to tackle the center of the plate item, so to speak, we may not, may not see the volume in the supply chain. What other things can we do when it comes to the sustainability message? So in the dog, for example, what are we serving it in? You know, and are we looking at you know, com compostable product? Are we, are we looking at ways to minimize packaging, which has a, a whole impact on the, the chain of, of, of a venue operation during the day? And I think those are great things that we're seeing across the business as highlighted in your report, but as you go out into the marketplace, um, you're seeing ways that we can make an impact on the overall footprint um, while we may, may necessarily not be able to solve for everything today. And uh, a number of the commitments that our company has made, and I, I know uh, yours as well, have, have a, a little bit of a tail on them because it's, it's going to take time for the supply chain to catch up. But in the interim, there are a number of great things that, that a lot of the operators are doing out there to, to accommodate the messaging but also the commitment that, that, that's out there. Yeah, it's definitely a, a level of commitment that is growing on both sides. I think uh, I, I do see more and more. Like I, I know now I've probably got five emails where farmers are asking me how they can produce more for me and work, in, and work in under my label just to produce more items. And, of course, the end source is making sure I have some place to go with those items. And that's always the, the other challenge, meeting that not only the demand on the consumer side but the demand for the business aspect of how we can efficiently, you know, work aside one alongside one another to deliver those products. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to you're not going to just raise cattle to make hot dogs. So how yeah. do we, you you know, how do we look at other ways to utilize, um, you know, the products that are yeah. being that are being harvested, so to speak? And and I think that's where there's been some great work on the culinary side of things to look at creative ways to utilize the full animal and 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 the introduction. It's really more of, of on trend with food and beverage in general. And I'll, uh, certainly you're, you're more of an expert on this than I am, but you're seeing that play out in menuing and you know, what the consumer is willing to eat today versus what they may not have right. eaten, been well, willing to eat I, five years and ago. And I think Let's consumers are, I think the fan is more receptive to, because they're seeing it more on television and food, they're seeing it in their local restaurants, mm -hmm. they're seeing the... I get tired of hearing farm to fork just because I think it's an overused expression. I like hoofed to plate. That's nice. <laughs> um, Some people might not be yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, but, but you're able to be a little bit more adventurous, adventurous um, in, some of the, in some of our venues because it's a little more palatable, no pun intended, for the fan to say, oh, okay, I get this. I've seen this on Top Chef where they used the they carved a steamship round of pork. That makes sense to me. I understand what that is. I'm not afraid of that because it's not the normal thing I'm used to seeing. And I think that that, um, that has only helped us. Mm -hmm. um, the, the visibility that taking a bit of a risk um, has had. Where we need to get the partnership to is from our partners mm -hmm. in buildings because I think that sometimes we culinarians, I, I think chefs are a little bit more willing to take the risk, and, and others are a little like, oh, I don't know, is it going to sell? Let's 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 give it a shot. And I think we, um, it's it's important for us as chefs to to nudge our our partners in our buildings too to say it's okay. Let's just try it once in the club. Let's give it a shot and see if they'll go for the, you know, whatever the new adventuresome thing is. Um, you know, if it's a fail, it's, it's probably not an epic fail. You know, it means that people didn't like it and we'll try something different. But, but it's taking the chance um, where you might not take a risk before bringing in the local farmer. We've had great success mm -hmm. bringing farmers into, the, into our venues and letting them set up sort of shop and answer mm -hmm. questions. And that's been hugely successful um, because people want to feel like they connect with with something. They want to connect with something some way, um, even if it's knowing where their hot dog came from, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a perfect example. How can we enhance the, the fan experience, enhance mm -hmm. the event with these 
potentially more novel food service practices, whether it's gardens on site or compostable zero waste programs. What, what examples can we, potentially we've got some on the, on the screen here, what examples can we pull out? We've, we've talked generally about leadership in this space, but the diversity of, of case studies and examples are, are really strong. Give us a few from, from your experiences, your venues to date. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think, first of all, just to, to Jennifer's point, uh, on the venue partnership, um, it all starts with having a commitment from the top um, in, in the partnership. So both organizations um, that are working together need to have that focus. And there's, 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 there's no way those 20 venues are, are, are represented without that, that collaboration on the operations side, the team side, and the food and beverage side. Um, and, and then I think it even gets further to the team on the ground being willing uh, to have that passion um, and, uh, and, and care for, for the, the initiatives they're taking. I, you know, I'll, I'll just share an example of, of one event that occurred over the weekend um, that, um, that just amazed me of what our team was doing in Cleveland um, with a partner of the Browns, uh, University Hospitals, who's one of their, their major sponsors, uh, was doing their annual uh, fundraising event called the Five Star Sensation. And um, with the Browns, we were, we were essentially brought on board uh, to ensure that that event um, was a zero waste event. And so our food and beverage team from the stadium, um, not only did we house all the preparations for the event at the stadium in the kitchens so that we could uh, oversee any of the, the waste management components, but then on site at the event, um, helping with the, 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 um, the sorting and then making sure that everything was brought back to the stadium to be composted in our, um, in our system there at the stadium. It, it, it's just those things don't happen without um, a partnership with the team, with their sponsorship, and, and having the passion on the ground. Um, the, other, the other thing that I'll, that I'll point to, um, I think just as, a, as an example of where, where, where we, we've seen this, just this incredible exponential growth um, of the trend would be, would be to look at buildings um, where we operate both the food and the facility management. And so we're able to, con to, have, to have an impact on that collaboration between um, what's coming in and what's going out, <laughs> if I could use uh, those expressions, just make, <laughs> make things a lot, a lot more um, efficient at the end of the day, where we're able to talk um, in, in, in a lot of the same language and we eliminate a lot of the push-pull uh, to, um, to ensure that, uh, that we're driving um, that full system of, of sustainability through the venues. Um, but what, what, every day there's something different happening, and a lot of it is influenced by what the public is, is seeing on TV, and a, and a lot of it's also influenced by the partners that we bring in, our chef partners that are, um, that are making commitments to, um, to their restaurants and to their brands and expecting that we're going to uphold those same expectations in, in our operations. And, and so the challenges are coming from a lot of different directions, but the output is, is actually quite impressive. Yeah, and you, can't, you cannot do it uh, um, without that partnership. You can't. I mean, there's no way that we, doing the U.S. Open at the U.S. US Tennis Association, you know, the USTA um, facilities in Flushing, New York, where I spend almost four weeks of my life every year, um, there's no way that we could be as responsible as we are without our partner's commitment to it and their devotion to it. I mean, we, I think we recycle like 12,000 gallons of frying oil. We, um, I'm trying to remember the, the amount of compost. Let me look at my, we, well, first of all, we feed 700,000 people yeah. in a two and a half week period. So the amount of um, waste that has been converted to compostable waste has grown exponentially over years since they have partnered with us. There's no way you can do that sort of thing in an event that large unless your partner wants to join in with you. I can't Thanks. see that far. <laughs> she's looking, she's pointing I, I to the thing and saying, read it. And I'm like, I can't read that far. <laughs> 180 tons uh, composted yeah. at the U.S. Open. It's, it's a huge, that's it a huge amount that before was garbage. And I know for a fact because we have to push the, I mean, and it's, it's a commitment on both sides. We're physically wheeling down our compost bins from every area, every night, ourselves, myself included. So it does take, it takes a huge commitment, but it's got to come from, from all areas. It has to come from all areas. So we are already getting a flurry of questions from the audience. I think... All, we have to answer all the <laughs> I can keep going. One, one overlaps with mine. First? Yeah. <laughs> one overlaps with mine, so I think, I think is a safe bet. You, um, you talked about the rapid change in, in greener food, greener game day food desired. 
by fans and the rapid evolution of, of interest in different menu options from fans. How do we best engage our, our local Aramark, Levy, other concessionaire food providers to have a conversation about this more responsible food in our facilities? This is coming from a venue operator of, of some sort. How can we be uh, engaging that conversation and, and sparking that conversation with the concessionaire? Maybe planning, I think. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it starts. Start. It starts by pointing at this slide. And yeah. if you're, if you're, I would take that, that that book back and say, why aren't we on here? And candidly, um, that will happen in a number of our venues. Oh, that yes. <laughs> once this report gets out there, um, why aren't we doing this? Yeah. Um, we're all in this in the business uh, that's very competitive. Um, you know, truth be told, our two companies aren't supposed to even sit this close to each other. Um, but that's we're we're getting along like really well. Take pictures, everybody. We want a good selfie. <laughs> so, Somebody tweet it out. Um, but at the end of the this day, is there's there is oh, high is. level of uh, there's a high level of competitive spirit, and and asking the question of, of why aren't we doing some of these things, and and walk again. It's the crawl, walk, run. You don't have to you don't have to do it all, but start with packaging. Start with you know, is there a place we can put a garden in? Um, what are we doing from a health and wellness perspective with our menus? Do we have a gluten-free option? Where are we on the vegetarian spectrum? Do we have local farmers? Ask those questions, and I think you'll get, you'll, you'll probably be surprised that you're going to get more uh, positive answers um, than you may have thought. And, and one of the reasons is we're not always really good at telling our story. Um, and, and so think, thankfully the alliance has helped to tell that story, but I think it will continue to get the message out there of what's happening. So. Yeah, no, I think that that's true. And I think um, you know, part of it, the, the challenge too, and I said this before, is that sometimes we're not great. We're not great at giving ourselves credit for what we are doing, and so we might have an item. You know, we'll get a, a note from a fan that says, "Hey, I was all through the, the stadium, and I didn't see one single vegetarian item." And we're like, "How could you not see it? They were in three stands." And so, so sometimes we're not great about making it known where things are. I think we can all do a better job um, of kind of. Not, and it's not about patting ourselves on the back, but it's about letting the consumer know and the fan know what the availability is. Um, it's, it's using better signage. It's using better wayfinders. It's directing the fans to the things they might want. The truth is the, the percentage of people that are really looking for it, although they may be few, they are very vocal. They are very vocal, small amount, number of people, but very vocal. And the more vocal they are, the more we'll answer. Because we don't want it to be a negative thing, obviously. We want it to be a positive thing. And so, um, and so it's working together, I think, to, to put it out there in a better way. Yeah, you talk about people being vocal and wanting this understanding of, of what they're getting and what's, what's available to them. You know, I have, the, I have the distinct luxury of having the ability to go directly to you know, one of these purveyors and say, hey, could we do that? Can we do this, or how can we do that? Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of vendors don't have that option. Like, you know, it, as you said, a lot of times that start from the top down. It usually doesn't start from the bottom up, mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you get a massive amount of people working in the on the ground level to push that push for something there. And um, that is what I think we all need to make sure we're doing. Is if every one of us in this room just sat down and, and said, "Who is who's the one person I could talk to, or the one person that would have an interest in this?" to find out, you know, you'd be amazed at what asking one person can find the next step. I mean, for me, it was, I had a casual conversation, again, with, you know, one of, uh, with Lisa Boaz, who works in our community service department. She was like, you know what, like, let me take this to Kevin. And Kevin calls me, and I was going, Kevin's the vice president of the team. He goes, hey, do you want to do this, or can you do this? Okay. That's, that's another level of how we had to approach it. And you never know who, what one simple question and can lead you to. So, you know, never be afraid to ask that. That's one thing I've I've learned in all my years. So we have another question that's similar to this. In getting the ball rolling at a venue that hasn't engaged publicly or behind the scenes as actively in, in more sustainable game day food, where would you recommend starting? Not necessarily just the conversation, but would you think about the serviceware first, the packaging? Would you think about the waste stream? Or would you begin with better understanding and data around fan demand and menu design? Which elements do you think sparks uh, that, that real activity burst? I think, I feel like packaging has, um, not, I want to say it has gotten pretty good. So I don't know if I would start there because I feel like most buildings, at least most of ours, are, are well along that path already. 
Um, I, I think it's in menu planning, but then again, I'm the one in the white jacket with my name on it. So, so I will always say that it's probably in planning for next year. It's taking the results from, from previous, if you have them and if they're good and the information is good, and saying, where, how do we plan our menus to um, introduce these items or to, to better speak to, to the needs? Um, and then once you've done that, and you engage, and you engage the build. You engage whoever you need to engage to get a stronger voice about moving that forward and plan it so that it's um, so that it makes sense. So you don't set yourself up for failure. You know, I think um, somebody said to me once on our sweet menu, we have two packages. We have a uh, we have lots of packages, but one of them is a vegan package and one's a vegetarian package. And every year, some of the buildings, the chefs will say, we don't sell very many of these. Can we not have them on the menu? And I say no, because for the two or three that we sell, it says something. It says something to even have it available. And we're taking elements of it and making mini packages out of it to make it less of a specialty item and more something that would be added on to a, a bigger piece of a menu. And so you, you take it and, and massage it. You say one year, well, okay, maybe this didn't work this way. Let's change it. I think we often throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to these things. We give it one shot. You can't, give, you can't give the veggie burger one shot in one season because it probably won't catch. Maybe the location was wrong. Maybe the name of the menu item is not right. Maybe people don't understand that that's what it is. Maybe you need to move it to a different stand where, where you know, it gets more visibility and more traffic. You know, I think you have to ask yourself some hard questions and not just go with the first, the first thing that comes. But I, but I do think it starts in planning your menu for next year. So if there's anybody in an arena in the building, you're going to probably hear from, <laughs> from chefs that are going to be wanting to plan for next year because that's happening right now. I might take it just one, one, one click backwards and suggest that you have to start with the consumer. And, and if you're looking to develop a program for your venue, you really need to understand what does your fan, what is your consumer looking for, um, and get that data to help you make the right decisions. All too often, we all think we know the answers, but let's, you know, if you sit down with a dozen fans, you're going to learn more about your venue than, and your food, and you specifically drill into food and beverage, um, you're going to learn a lot. And I think you can take that and then shift into the planning on the menu. That's going to be the easiest fix. The, the, um, the waste management piece um, is, is a big one to tackle. You have so many variables in play from your municipality in terms of what, you know, what resources they have available, what your infrastructure might provide. Um, certainly a big one to tackle and a huge opportunity, but if you're looking for the, the short-term crawl, I think it's going to be in the menu. I can't disagree with either one of you. I think you said right, the consumer is going to set a basis point and, and give you ideas of what to make the menu item. And then, of course, when you're talking about waste, I mean, any time that you can start eliminating waste and people will get to see that and participate in it, now you're engaging the consumer to participate with you in growing this green footprint, as we'll say, and reducing the waste and reducing, you know, the, uh, even the food waste there. You know, you give them the opportunity. When you're talking to the consumer, they give you specific items to try and figure out how we can make this better. You can take it from every level, whether it be, you know, you're taking your suite level and saying these are the packages that we really like and these are the packages that we drill down to. And as you said, reducing, you know, maybe what's something that's a small or rarely sold large item package into something that can be an add-on. You know, that's improving, one, it's improving your bottom line, and two, it's improving, you know, for the, consu the consumer. They're saying, well, you know what, they haven't eliminated this because they haven't, they haven't sold a lot of it because, we're, you know, we're not a massive vegetarian society at any sporting venue I'm pretty sure of. But you're allowing them to participate in their own way and enjoy, still enjoy the environment without a question. And so, exactly, and the variety is there as well. So those two things are definitely great standpoints to go can you talk about the interplay of what is happening, these strong case studies in venue, and how that is leading to regional, global efforts on your part, uh, particularly with your corporations more broadly? How are you trying to advance sustainability goals as, as a company? Sure. You know, I think um, one of the things that we've taken a hard look at in, in the last 12 months is, is our purchasing platform and the commitments that we've made. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of public interest surrounding um, where you're getting your, your product from, uh, and balancing that messaging with the availability has been something that, that has been very important to us. So, you know, we, we study the five freedoms and we look at how do those impact the vendors that we're doing business with. 
Um, and we've made some very hard line commitments, and, and they're, they're probably very parallel to, to what Compass Group has done um, in terms of, of, of uh, dairy, eggs, uh, you know, pork, beef, uh, those types of things, seafood. Um, are all are all broadly focused within um, within the organization. Um, you know we have we have the luxury of of operating on you know over 500 college campuses. So the consumer of tomorrow is telling us what they want today, and so we really we, we mine that data to understand what are their expectations when it comes to food, when it comes to the, the entire waste system, and how do we then migrate all that data across uh, across the company when we're when we're serving folks um, you know in these different in these different landscapes. Um, we, the one area we don't talk to is our prisoners. We don't, we don't ask their <laughs> feedback. They're not allowed to vote. Uh, not, I mean, they're allowed to yeah. vote. Don't put that on record. There's some, <laughs> I don't know, are they? But anyways, they're not allowed to tell us if they don't like their food. Um, yeah, we'll so, take you out right, there, but right. sorry. Yeah, you know, um, it, that's, that's a tough question to answer because we're doing things. I would say probably the biggest way we're participating is really engaging um, in, in a regional way, both our regional chefs and our regional operations in really doing local menu design. We used to design our menus um, at 980 North Michigan Avenue here in Chicago. And the menu was the menu. And everybody sold sort of, particularly in our premium areas, the same menu. We have in the last four years alone dialed that back considerably. I would say 70% of our menu is a core menu. And we have to do that in, in a certain way because it not only keeps up brand identity, but it also um, makes it more financially um, easy for the location to sort of stick with a core menu item. It's a purchasing thing. But 30% of the menu that they're designing is coming locally. It's, and it's allowing our locations to utilize local farms and utilize local products and local dairies and cheese makers and provide that. But again, because it's a little bit smaller, it's manageable from a purchasing standpoint. I think the one challenge they face is that they have to price things. And, and this is the economic part that sometimes people don't want to talk about. But the cost of it can be um, sometimes expensive um, or more expensive. And so it's navigating through how do we offer these great items in a way that the consumer can actually benefit from them and, and spend their money on them and take advantage of the opportunity to enjoy something that is locally designed for them and, and um, celebrates the local community. And we try to identify local as within 100 miles. Um, um, and so we're seeing more and more of that, partly because our clients and partners are asking for it, our fans are asking for it. And, it's so wonderful that we're now able to be in a position where we can offer that more and more, which I think is, is really nice. So we have just a few minutes left. I think one exciting way to end a discussion is to turn the tables and ask, as leaders in greener game day food, as this, as this trend emerges nationally and globally, how are you challenging your staff? How are you challenging your partners to think about this issue? What questions are you asking? Where are you looking for, for better data and, and for more information? You know, first of all, I think um, one of the challenges that, that I have right now is we've been on this panel for almost an hour and we haven't talked about beer. Um, and that's a very important part of, of what we do each and every day. Um, and that, that is becoming um, increasingly popular in, in mm -hmm. terms of the localization movement, the customization movement. And, and that's actually an easier one to solve when it comes to the pricing discussion than it is on food. Um, and so that really doesn't answer your question. I, I just needed to talk about beer. Um, <laughs> what was your, your question? Was, was I'm not going to hold you back from talking. Oh, about how are we going to challenge? Feel yeah. I, I think beer in Bratsko, great. Beer and your and your your farm. Uh, the the question was about um, the challenges in the business. So I think the one that that we've touched on, but we haven't hit really kind of hit, hit head on, is the the economic equation within the industry. Um, and for the venue operators in the room, um, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. For those that, that aren't in a venue, you know, we, we are in a, a very competitive space where uh, the, the, the rights that, we're, or that we are granted to operate in one of these uh, wonderful venues can be fairly pricey and fairly expensive, and that has an economic um, impact on, on how we run our business. The biggest challenge that, that I think this, not, not, not movement, but this progression uh, this expectation from the consumers is going to face is 
when does price um, become an inhibitor? Um, and when do we say, you know what, we can't offer that particular farm product because now we're, we're going to have to price this product so high where it just doesn't make sense. And having that very difficult conversation where there is an economic adjustment that occurs in the framework that has been established for many years within this industry is when I think we'll start to see the pace even, um, even become more uh, accelerated. Are you nudging it now? Do you think oh, yeah. some oh, of these absolutely. case studies think, yeah. are, are really starting to push that, that yeah, conversation? There's no doubt. Um, and I think what you're seeing is we're, we're starting to see the discussion about where is food and beverage uh, in the revenue stream um, prioritization for a sports team? Mm -hmm. And, um, and has it, does it have more of an impact on fan experience, which will then drive season ticket renewals and drive ticket sales and drive viewership, which will drive broadcast, or is it a standalone revenue stream that we need to be dependent on? If, if a venue or team is looking at it as a standalone revenue stream that we're dependent on, it's a much harder conversation. But if you're balancing it with where does it fit on the, the spectrum of fan experience mm -hmm. and the, um, the holistic impact that it can have on the team's brand and, and, um, and, and their, their marketing approach, mm -hmm. well, then there's, there's an opportunity to move this along faster. Can these many initiatives help established venues as destination restaurants? Can they be centers within these communities for fantastic food and, and really build that fan experience? I think uh, that's uh, an yeah, important absolutely. factor. No doubt. That, that's, a, that's a goal that I think when we opened City Field, um, we, were, we set out to you know, make sure that it was, it was going to be known as, as one of the best in baseball. And, and we all have those examples. Uh -huh. um, and unfortunately, given you know, some of the Mets' performance for, for many years, it was the best restaurant in, in Long Island. Um, it started in Queens, actually. It started to become you know, a much more popular mm -hmm. place. But dining is part of that experience. And, and, yeah. and there's a countless number of examples where, yeah. where mean, that Moda becomes... Yeah, I mean, Center in Portland yeah. has the same thing. When we, when we designed that building and, and, and what is laid out there, food was an enormous focus. Um, Mar where the Marlins play down in Miami, Florida, same thing. And so Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Um, I would say that food, honestly, sometimes I'm hard-pressed to remember the team's name because we're, you know, you're thinking so much about the food that is in the building. Um, I think that it definitely, it's a package deal. It's a whole entertainment experience when you go to a game. And, and frankly, it's, you know, we want to make sure that it's, um, that the fan can really enjoy the whole experience uh, because it's, it's a night out. I mean, it's not an inexpensive thing to go to a game, um, for a, take a family of four, or even a couple. So you want to make sure they're getting the best and most entire, um, most fulfilling, fun experience they can have. Um, and that they feel like they, I don't know, that they walked away like with a point of difference. They walked away experiencing something different. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And hopefully the, this trend in more sustainable food is really augmenting that. Yeah. And so, so last minute, Will, burning questions. What, what do you want to see more of in, in your work at your farm? You know, I, I think every, as everybody else would say, it's, it's just, just that steady growth and steady understanding. You know, you talk about price being a real concern. I think that's one that, as a beef producer, we're fighting daily. I mean, beef producers are at an all-time high, and, or beef prices are at an all-time high. So that's one that we're trying to meet that challenge. Like, how do you... How do you come to the consumer and say, I want you to get this, but the problem is that the prices are keep going up. The other side of it is, is again, the production. You know, making sure that you're having quality production and working alongside farmers and other individuals who are either even complementary to what you need. You know, if I'm looking at a hot dog, well, I've got to find somebody who's doing fruits who make maybe, or, you know, vegetables who can make ketchup or something. I don't know. But we, you have to create those alliances and allegiances all together at once just to grow all alongside. Thank you all. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.